leave your name tags um, on the table on the way out so that we can recycle them. And Amanda, yes? Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And so without further ado, I'll give it to you, Leslie. Thank you. Hello, I'm Leslie Chadwick, your next door neighbor from St. Albans School. And it's a privilege to be here with you because I'm in the back row at the nine o'clock service with my children most often, collapsed in a heap after a long week of work and getting fed by the people of St. Albans. So thank you for having me. And I, I'm intrigued to read your questions for James because I found them at least into four categories. And the first category was shame. And it seemed a lot of practical theology was being, you know, people wanted to, for you to elaborate on your notion of shame. Please repeat your favorite verse from the New Testament and remind us of where it is found. <laughs> okay, um, I, I, I've, got a, I've got a mic. Um, the verse is, uh, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, thought as nothing the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. It's from the epistle to the Hebrews. I forgot exactly which chapter and verse. But that's what Protestants are for. <laughs> um, so uh, you, you, you know roughly where to, uh, to find it. Um, I think shame is a hugely important uh, dimension of the New Testament, which we pass over at our peril, um, because it is such a hugely important part of our own lives, which we also pass over at our peril. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that unless we pay attention to some of the key phrases and things which are set up in the New Testament, we avoid that. For instance, the word glory in the uh, New Testament, uh, doxa, is a word which comes from reputation. It's good reputation. In fact, St. Augustine's definition of heaven is being noticed, being clearly noticed with praise. Clara cum laude notitia. Um, being noticed, but there's no, it's this sense of being noticed. That's what glory consists in. And the reverse of glory is Shame. And that's why, in so many cases, um, those who, uh, he talks about it, those who, who do this will receive glory from my Father, and those who don't, shame. The, that duo is absolutely central in the, uh, in the New Testament, the glory-shame glory, shame duo. And let's remember that both are forms of reputation there how we consider each other. Um, now, one of the things I think which, which uh, we all face, I don't know how we all face other. I mean, it's, it's been one of my stories of having to work through this as a gay man, which at least at the time I was growing up meant uh, being told you were an abomination. And of course, interiorizing that, because of course it was what Jesus said, or at least the people who were around you told you that that's what <laughs> uh, Jesus said. So shame is a, is a very strange thing, because you, you take it on board. Shame typically has three phases or kinds of reaction. There's uh, fight, flight, which is the most frequent one, and freeze. Uh, because it's, in a sense, it's pushing, you, it's pushing you into the space of death. You feel as though you have fallen through a hole in the floor, or would like to fall through a hole in the floor, and that's one of the images we use, isn't it, when we talk about shame. Oh, I swallow me up, earth, you know. That's the, uh, the kind of thing. Um, and it produces all sorts of strange reactions in us, which then run at us. 
until we recognize what is driving us. I think shame is vastly more powerful uh, a force in our lives and all sorts of strange bits of behavior which we tend to have a moralistic take on are not in fact, uh, as it were, bad behavior. They're shame-driven behavior. And it's either the fight, flight, more often flight, or freeze, playing dead, because it's so impossible. And of course, what you do with one of those is that you defect from your life in place, and you therefore allow to be created within you and take part in the creation of a false self to smile and say hello and get on with everybody. And then you have no notion that that self is completely out of touch with your feelings and everything like that because you've given up on your feelings a long time ago. But you are quite, at some root level, you're aware that there is a hole in your heart. There's a hole in your life. Um, and that therefore this very fragile mask of a person is what you have to offer instead. And that you don't really know how to react with empathy to uh, people. You notice other people doing it. <laughs> so you have to imitate uh, what they're doing, or you'll find yourself imitating uh, what they're doing. But one of the things this leads to is contempt. And I want to stress that, because I think that that's, if you like, one of the most difficult things, but also one of the telltale cover-ups of shame. If people have contempt for other people, it's usually a cover-up of the shame that I have uh, myself. And it's a way of silently exercising a superiority that I fear I do not have. <laughs> does that make yes. does that make sense? Um, so when we think of our discussions between the elder brother and the younger brother in its various modern forms, um, I cannot help thinking how how regularly that is a part of our lives and our discourses, and how much polarization isn't frozen shame <laughs> locked into its, uh, what's the word? Its binary forms, which is contempt and accusation. Contempt being silent accusation. <laughs> when I don't even want to acknowledge you enough to actually indicate my superiority to you. Other people will just notice that I'm treating you as though you don't exist. That's particularly a British thing. Um, but uh, I, I see that uh, you have caught up since the days of your... Subjugation. <laughs> 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 yeah, terrible subjugation. Since the days of your uh, war of secession. Um, um, Well, but if it's, if it's part of the same, do you think do you I should begin to reply? Uh, yeah. Just an, an anecdote. Um, I read this in a, an article, and I can't actually remember which article it was. I'm not sure whether it was Adam Sirwa writing in The Atlantic. He's one of your, I think, really top uh, article writers. And, top understanders of race relations in this country. Uh, but he described a, I don't know if you, you remember, after the Trump victory in November 2015, the press went one into one of its usual, uh, gosh, how didn't we note, notice who all these voters were who uh, uh, voted for MAGA and all of that. Um, so they went to try and find representative people in different uh, in different places. And it wasn't only the press that did that, but genuinely interesting thinking, you know, what have we missed uh, in our country? What have, we, what have we failed to understand? And I think I'm right in saying that the, the incident reported by uh, Sirwa was in Wisconsin, where uh, a group of Eastern liberal 
now they would be called elite woke. But that, that at that stage, the words elite and woke hadn't yet acquired the currency that they've acquired since. Uh, went deliberately to visit a community that had, was a farming, uh, was MAGA, and, and all of that. Um, expecting to find that these were all people who held diametrically opposed values to their own. What they discovered was that, in fact, in most areas, they held exactly the same values <laughs> uh, as their own. But that these people felt humiliated by not being able to reach the same positions so easily. In other words, things that liberal coastal types seemed to just swim with as kind of obvious and natural and duh, um, these people agreed with if you thought about it, but it wasn't, wasn't something that came naturally to them. And that what felt humiliating was the gap. <laughs> How do you get there? That makes me feel bad. <laughs> and that's the space where, as it were, shame turns into contempt. And that finds itself mirrored in a contempt, which is also immune to certain sorts of shame. <laughs> and how do we not spark off each other's shame, but inhabit uh, our shame together? And this is what it seems to me is part of the absolute central role of Christianity. And it seems to me that one of the, the, the really sad things about what has happened in all our cultures is how just at the time when it's most needed, it has become itself locked into a shame-producing culture. Whereas, and part of what locks into a shame-producing culture is a bad understanding of Jesus appearing among us to put an end to sin. Because if our basic understanding of what Jesus was doing was paying a price so that we can be forgiven. That's actually not very kind. Because if you let someone off, I'm sure you're really an awful person, but I'm going to be very kind to you and let you off the punishment for all the awful things that you've done. That's actually not a very kind thing to, to do or, or say to a person. Because you're leaving them with their shame. Which is why it seems to me that it's so important that what Jesus was doing in going to his death was occupying the place of shame that we put other people into. In other words, in as far as we can refer to it as a sacrifice, and in as far as we can refer to an angry divinity, it was God giving God's self generously into the midst of us who are the angry divinity, whose wrath needs assuaging, because that's how we behave to each other. And that he's occupying that space so that we can begin to relax about it. He's saying, yes, you did this to me, you tend to do this to each other, and I'm not here to call you out on it. I've been happy to occupy this space, really because I want to see whether any of you can be nudged into playing a different game. <laughs> I'm not here to say, you wicked, you spend your life crucifying Jesus. You've heard the kind of sermons that, uh, that do that. The whole point is, no, I have come to occupy the space of shame so that you need no longer be run by it. And because you're no longer run by it, you're able to start to be vulnerable to each other rather than freezing into contempt <laughs> and then being damn righteous about it. <laughs> because the real problem is self-righteousness, <laughs> not being wrong or whatever it is that we're trying to cover the shame about. Does that, does that make any sense? But anyhow, so that's, so that's I, my attempt to... to well, I mean, uh, the idea of God nudging us into a different game reminds me we had a restorative justice training next door in which we discussed the compass of shame where we either withdraw, attack self, attack others, or avoid. And the idea of God asking us questions like Cain, mm -hmm. what was the question from Cain? 
Where is your brother? Where is your brother? And then when he, the, when Adam and Eve are hiding as part of their avoidance and withdrawal, then he asks them, where are you, yeah. to Adam. And this question says, could you say more about our shame and how it gets us to the party? Yeah, I think that's, that's a very, very good, um, that's a very good thing. Because for us, the word shame is usually a negative word, except that we are aware that behind the negative word there is a positive sense. One of the most famous expressions, uh, words associated with shame spoken in this city was, have you no shame at last? <laughs> I forget the name of the lawyer, but he was facing Senator McCarthy. Sorry? Welsh. Welsh, that's right with the suggestion that there is a positive quality of delicacy between people, which is very vulnerable, very precious, and very easily trodden upon. But that, that is itself a good thing, that the ability to treat each other that respects our shame is something you would expect from a good doctor, for instance, who is able to touch parts of your body that you would not want to be touched in ways that provoke no shame, because they're part of a gentle, therapeutic relationship in which someone is building you up rather than dragging you down, as it were. And that actually, that is true of all of us, that all of us have a gentle, if you like, force field around us, associated both to our body and to our emotions, which can be very easily tipped into becoming something negative, but that in itself is a very good thing. And that in as far as we allow that to be maintained, then we really are able to party. <laughs> Because that kind of self-building up togetherness is the very reverse of a humiliating togetherness. People are not ashamed of each other and are able to party. I will just throw it out there how interesting it is and ask you to imagine for yourselves, since I will not dare to give you the answer since we might be being recorded, uh, why groups of shirtless gay men highly tanked up on alcohol have far fewer fights amongst themselves than shirtless, highly tanked up on alcohol straight men. <laughs> what, what are one group ashamed of that the other are not? What form of shaming have the other one group dealt with that the other have not? Just think of that. Thank you. Well, a lot of shame questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think it's, I think it's so important. I really do. I, I, do I think that dealing with uh, understanding you know, when we're coming to the Eucharist, we are supping from the shamed one. And that is how we enter into glory. We've been asked to be ambassadors of the shamed one. I think that there's a resonance to St. Paul's, you know, be ambassadors for Christ, with the self-effacing father coming out of the party and begging uh, the older brother to, uh, to come in. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, this is good. Please review and wrap up from the morning, the cruel Christian or statements on shame. I could not keep up. I hope, I hope, <laughs> I hope we've done that. Yeah. Feel good? Does, does the person who asked that feel, feel her, her, her or his question has been heard? If, if I failed, would that person like to?
I, Was I there might, a phrase, I, the cruel Christian? Cruel Christian? I, it, you may, I may have done. I may have, uh, you, I, but I can't exactly remember in which context if I did. Can you remember it? It's the cruel Christianity that says objectively. That yes. Yes, he says. So. It's, it's, a, it's a cruel Christianity that says. Objectively, your sins are forgiven. So I was, making, I was making the point, which I tried to repeat now, that just to say your sins are forgiven, but I'll leave you with your shame. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's not a kind thing to do. So it's the assumption of this objectivist, uh, transactional understanding of the crucifixion and its effect upon our life that leaves out the notion of the presence that makes available to us the possibility of receiving our shame tenderly. Uh, that, that seems to be, so that was a, thank, uh, thank you. you, thank you for remembering. Uh, this is a transition That's good. The other questions uh, have to do with family systems, ah. another set that have to do from moving to shame and how, what is the approach or greeting to the, to the sibling who won't come to your party? And would you, you know, please repeat what you said about woke versus unwoke. But this whole mm. idea about getting a sibling to come to the party and having just come from a family vacation <laughs> with lots of sister pairs <laughs> in different generations, you can just see how this yeah. teaching might work. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, that's the question. How do, how, do we, how do we get over our own self-righteousness mm. to be able to emerge from the party as a non-threatening <laughs> inviter. Uh, because that, that seems to me to be the extraordinary thing about the self-effacing <laughs> uh, father. Because he comes out disguised as a servant. Uh, and it's precisely <laughs> so that the other can speak down, doesn't mind the, that the other speaking down to him and is able to stay there and nudge the person to come in. And how do we do that? I mean, it's, it's, it's terribly, terribly difficult. I've spent most of my adult life attempting to do that with relation to the gay thing in the church. I think that what I've learned is that the really difficult thing to do is to uh, allow affection for the bastard <laughs> to be the actual principal emotion rather than something that you feel you ought to have for reasons of family. <laughs> While your first reactions are in fact the moralistic ones, the, the righteous ones, the standing up for what is right with things, all of which tend to have a, just a hint of putting things right, winning, uh, resentment. Being prepared to be the bad guy for long enough that one oneself has affection. That's very difficult, but I think that that's, uh, that's part of what it's about. I'm sorry, it's not a very, it's not a very good answer because I, I am certainly no better a practitioner of this than... than it's hard to love our nearest uh, neighbor. Uh, it is, because our nearest, our nearest neighbors are the ones who are most like us, and therefore, yeah. When we get stuck in these roles in our families, and it says you mentioned the problem of not being able to go to each other's parties. Can you say anything about how this relates to parents, siblings, etc., and refusing to go to their gay relative's wedding? <laughs> well, I think well, that's, that's just yet another level of sadness. Um, but then when people are, are brought up in a certain way, uh, and one of the things which I learned in the case of, of, of my own uh, father, and it took a long time for me to understand this, was how the totalitarianism of his faith system disguised fragility. The stronger the structure somebody needs, the more fragile 
they are underneath. Uh, the stronger their faith is, the more relaxed they are, because they know that it's not they who's holding the thing together. It's someone else. And if it's someone else holding the thing together, then A, you don't need to be so good yourself, and you don't need to be too, so worried about other people <laughs> who don't match up. Uh, but I think that's very difficult for people who've been brought up, as you know, and it's now it's, it, uh, I've noticed that it's absolutely the creed of the new international. Um, uh, Putin last night gave a speech <laughs> in which basically he repeated what one might call white Christian nationalist doctrine, which is uh, woke is evil, gay is even more evil, cancel culture is the terrible thing they do to us. It's a grievance, it's a grievance package. <laughs> it's a grievance package that's holding together a collapsed world or a collapsing world. It's a, it's a, it's a fear reaction. How does one say, am I going to be able to be weak enough to have the strength <laughs> to hold that person and yet not be run by their strange uh, needs to create order completely arbitrarily? <laughs> um, but I think that that's, that's the question. Can, can the Holy Spirit make us weak enough <laughs> uh, to have the, the strength to actually survive? In political terms, that's, it's the same thing. Can a weak form of politics, which is what social democracy is, <laughs> allow itself to carry on being that when faced with uh, returning authoritarianism? <laughs> authoritarianism looks strong, but it's terribly weak on the inside and is always liable to self-destruction <laughs> because it has, what's the way, it has ways of producing ignorance about itself built into it so that its leaders end up not knowing what's really going on on their watch. So it's, an, it's not for nothing that Putin had to sack his security, uh, his intelligence agents from the Ukraine because they clearly fed him <laughs> a different story <laughs> about how the Ukrainians would react to the invasion, which is clearly what they thought he wanted to hear. Uh, th that is the danger with strong systems. They blind themselves to reality. Weak systems turn out to be much stronger if we're prepared to be weak enough to go along with them. <laughs> but that means agreeing and not minding the apparent loss of identity that goes along with such things, uh, being at least hopeful that identity will be, be being given to us over time and through the process. Uh, does that begin to... I think so, and the I'm idea of woke to... versus unwoke, I think that, oh, yeah. that it's more polarizing to label each other. I, yeah, well, see, and here again, I do, you know, I, obviously I'm unaware of the, the full scale of, of things in uh, your country. I live in Spain, so I live outside the immediate language sphere uh, in which this is, uh, this is current. Um, from what I understand, when people accuse things of woke, they're accusing people of things with which I would agree. Usually they're things like, you know, being aware that this country, like my country, uh, to enormous extent built its riches on the back of the North Atlantic slave trade. This by and large seems to me to be historically undeniable. <laughs> um, uh, suggesting that there might be a collective necessity to revise our myths about ourselves uh, and indeed engage in some form of restructuring of our economies so as to take account of the people who have been disadvantaged by it does not seem to me to be a, uh, a heretical and evil a communist or uh, any other thing. Uh, it seems to me to be perfectly straight obvious. It's also perfectly clear that bits of that awareness are often grasped by people and then used as enemy, uh, used as weapons against other people. So that if you don't get the name right, if you don't get uh, the circumstances right, you can be accused of this, that, and the other. And then there is this uh, game of, uh, as it were, self-righteousness. And there is left-wing self-righteousness, and there is right-wing self-righteousness. <laughs> the the left-wing self-righteousness seems to me usually to grasp a bit of something that is true and turn it into a weapon. And the right-wing self-righteousness seems to be to simply deny that the, anything is wrong and then use that as a weapon. So it's in, <coughs> impenitence dressed with righteousness 
and the other is bits of righteousness held within penitence. And that, that ultimately produces an, a mirror clash. But the really important thing is we only, in fact, learn who we really are in as far as we are being forgiven. The opening up to the process of creation works, in the case of the human race, through being forgiven. It's not you start off at somewhere, uh, somewhere level. No, we start off pre-screwed. That's, the, that's what the doctrine of original sin means, is that we, we start off pre-screwed. And the adventure of life for all of us is taking part in at least a partial beginning of the unscrewing. <laughs> and that happens, our realignment with what is real happens through us being forgiven individually and collectively. So how is it that the truth, the finding out about the reality, can be lived into by people who are being forgiven and therefore are not inclined to use it as a weapon <laughs> of accusatory righteousness? And how is it that people who feel frightened by the realization that the old myth, the old order don't hold, how is it that they are going to be able to relax into being forgiven, which means being let go from being dominated by certain patterns of who we thought we were and what needs defending so that we can actually start to live together. These are difficult processes, but as it were, the, this is not a, I think, this is because I'm a Catholic theologian, this is not a discussion between uh, liberalism and illiberalism. This is a discussion about the shape of forgiveness. <laughs> which has liberal and illiberal consequences. <laughs> but that seems to me to be the, uh, I'm sorry to go on, but the, my understanding of woke versus uh, non-woke seems to me to be. And you're just uh, saying to get out of the struggle of self-righteousness. I think that the, self-righteousness is the problem. Self-righteousness usually involves a covering up of shame. Yeah. <laughs> Your essays, including Jesus the Forgiving Victim in today's lecture, moving from anger to love, are transformative in terms of reconciliation, joy, accepting the invitation to enter the party. How can we apply this learning to helping family members see the possibilities and benefits of this approach to Christian living? Hmm. Should I read it? Yeah, no, no, I'm just trying to think of a way in. Um, I don't, think, I don't think I've got a good answer to that. I think that um, family systems do recognize, uh, do recognize the way this, uh, this works. And I guess the, the real difficulty is being able to recognize dysfunctionality and accept dysfunctionality. And I think how difficult that is, the more you sacralize the family, as <laughs> the more you're in fact sugarcoating dysfunctionality. <laughs> As a general rule, <laughs> that seems to be the one of the things, which is why I'm so frightened of family values, um, because. <laughs> so then, acceptance is the antidote. Yeah, but it's it's the point of, uh, as I say, it's coming to the space where you're not having to try to sugarcoat things. That's the really difficult uh, thing uh, uh, to me. I mean, no family is perfect. Uh, no family system is perfect. Every family uh, is the possibility of things being turned into part of the new creation. <laughs> what is the turning point? If the Christian understanding is true, it will probably be because the one who was the black sheep <laughs> turns out, in fact, to be the one who holds the whole thing together. Uh, and that is, often, uh, that is often the case. Um, and family dynamics people know that, how the, the scapegoating works. Uh, and it can be the person who's been thrown out, who is then the one who later is able to hold the, the whole thing together and produce recognition of what a tense situation their expulsion was supposed to resolve. Um, and of course, none of this is conscious. It's only partially conscious. I think that's what's so difficult uh, for us. We tend to 
think of morality as uh, things in which we make clear decisions. But in fact, I don't know about you, but in, in my case, most areas uh, where I have been immoral have not been ones where I knew exactly, but where I half knew and half didn't know. There was this strange space of being aware and yet not wanting to be aware, <laughs> uh, from which an awful lot of our um, activity <laughs> arises. And I think that in terms of family dynamics, that's a, that's a constant thing, because it's a constant. Half being aware, half being not aware, and only later, oh my God, so that's what I was doing. <laughs> and being aware how repetitive that was uh, over time. Does that, does, that, does that make sense? I'm sorry I'm not able to give a more competent this goes along with that. I struggle with my family relationships, jealousy, resentment, favoritism. Given the parable and your interpretation, how do we truly move from anger to love after decades of learned behavior? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um. No easy answer. Uh, for me, it's an experience of, uh, over time, coming to find that all the things that I've been taught about forgiving enemies, praying for those who go them, are true. They're just not immediate. And then suddenly you find yourself in a stage where you're in a different reality, and you go, oh my God, yes. I have been taken to a different place. A bit of the party has already started. <laughs> uh, but as I say, it's not easy. It does seem to me that part of the reason why the Eucharist is given to us is that it's a sign of the beginning of the party. <laughs> and it's the drip, drip of us receiving the sign of the beginning of the party <laughs> that accompanied with the Lord's words, which accompany the Eucharist, uh, is designed to have this drip, drip on our hearts. So that just every now and then we get a tiny little hint of a shift in our understanding of relationships. And then, amazingly, we think, oh, I actually am on the inside of this. <laughs> but so I could, for me, the only good answer I can give is Eucharistic presence over time. Uh, I'm not sure that's a completely helpful answer, but it's... Well, and it's I heard better. prayer too, so if we pray about this son of yours, then eventually the drip drip will make him this brother of yours. Yeah. Ready for a new one? <laughs> Even after your brilliant, make sure I read this right, exposition of the main point of the parable is not obvious to whose side to take. What is its unifying principle? Unconditional love? No matter how his behavior, the younger son is back. Let's rejoice. Then there's a question mark there. Uh, it's not about taking sides. <laughs> <laughs> That's why there's a second half. <laughs> it's about the father wanting a party. I think that it's all about relativizing our struggles about good and bad, right and wrong. This is one of the persistently misread, misunderstood parts of the gospel. The gospels are not for good people. They are for bad people. And they take that very seriously. If, when Matthew says God, calls, God causes the sun to uh, rise and the rain to fall on good and bad and like, and past, and this, he is not joking. Luke constantly uses not good people as examples of people who get things right. In <laughs> uh, it's hugely important we have tended to moralize Christianity. Christianity is the undoing of morals from within. And the ultimate relativization of morals is that the Father wants a party. And it's us bastards he wants at the party. <laughs> That's a very difficult point to get. So we're used to her a language about which you have to say, oh, I'm a sinner. And we say that kind of piously. But we don't really mean it. 
or if we do, we have a little peccadillo or two, or peccadillo or two. But, but no, that's not what is expected. We're we are, we are expected to be bastards, traitors, persecutors, cowards, the non-socially acceptable <laughs> sins. It's people who have been caught up in those things and are not being shamed for them, are being shown that actually they're the people God wants at the party. And that the whole point of this teaching is to get us to relax about that, which curiously is the thing that starts to make us less bastards. <laughs> but it makes us less bastards after we start relaxing. It's not that we have got to get something right so that we can get into the party. That's the very reverse of what this is about. And of course, that's typically what we're taught, the emotional blackmail account of Christianity. Behave now, and I might let you in. That's, a, that's Christianity turned into pure boredom. It's the most boring possible thing. But hey, you, whoever you are, you're a bastard. Why not come to the party? You start thinking, who am I to go to the party? Well, let's discover who you are on the way. What's going to be your contribution to the party? What's the sort of fun you're going to have? But I've done this. Oh, forget that. What? <laughs> you see, there's a, that's what this language of the party is about. And he was teaching this quite strongly against the, the people who were grumbling at the time. He goes in to dine with yeah. sinners. And, uh, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. I'm coming to your house today, and then he gives away half yeah. his possessions. Can you please elaborate on the party? Who and what are we doing here? <laughs> In the first two parables, I believe it says the angels in heaven rejoice. Yeah, I, I wish I could give you a better elaboration of the party. It always seemed to me that one of the problems with the church, uh, at least my church, I suspect partly yours as well, uh, God obviously uh, chooses an awful lot of gay people to be uh, uh, to be priests, and one would hope it's because one would hope that it's because he thinks that they're good party people. <laughs> but in fact, but in fact, we screw it up so that only sullen queens get to dominate the <laughs> only sullen queens get to dominate the show. So the party queens are all uh, phased out. But by and large, you can you can probably have an idea that he wants to have a party by the sheer quantity of queens he has attempting to create the signs of the party. But anyhow, that's just my personal. Uh, 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 my personal sense. Um, the angels in heaven, I think the angels in heaven rejoicing is because they're sensing the whole point of when you have angels rejoicing is that they rejoice when creation is being brought into being. When you have angels rejoicing, this is the sense that this is actually the dynamic of creation. This is work. We're on the inside of that. We're not incidental bit players. The, the whole point of creation wants to lead to partying humans. God wants intelligent, active participants in a party. That's, that's how God imagines creation. That's, how, what he's, that's the adventure he's opened up. He wants us to be trying to discover, what's it going to be like? What's it going to be like? Let's, let's, see, let's see what they do with it. Let's see where they take it. I've opened it up to them. I've, I've put all the power in their hands. The Holy Spirit's been given to them. Now they can, now they can take it. What are they going to come up with? Uh, I think that that's the, uh, the dynamic. And the angels rejoicing is the angels ah, creation, that's our thing. The whole point of angels is that they're, they're the signs of divine wisdom pointing up the what for of things, that it gives off the glory of the creator, that it's, it's already beginning to give some signs of, of what this whole adventure is about. So I think that that's the, uh, when you, when you have angels, that's, that's what I begin to think of. The other ones are um, about theology and biblical exegesis. Mm. Your ex exegesis of biblical passages is unique. What process do you use when trying to discern what the Bible is telling you? Well, um, I hope it's not unique, uh, but I've had the privilege of a fantastic education. Uh, having been taught by some wonderful people both in, uh, in England and in Brazil. 
my biblical professors were excellent, and part of their excellence was in pointing me towards books. Um, of people who, I, in, in a couple of cases, I then, I then met. So one, just to give you a sense, in the exegetical world, because he's an Anglican, or now, now dead, but was an Anglican, is a wonderful uh, uh, old Brit called Duncan Durrett. And Duncan Durrett, J. Duncan M. Durrett, for those who want exact biblical, bibliographical references, he was the professor of ancient Middle Eastern law at the University of London at a very young age. And after a very short time of being professor of ancient Middle Eastern law at the University of London, he discovered that there were hardly any pupils interested in becoming, <laughs> doing doctorates in ancient Middle Eastern law. So he de decided to dedicate his time to what he referred to as New Testament detective work. But what he brought to his reading of the New Testament as a professor of ancient Middle Eastern law was an absolutely detailed knowledge of every element of how ancient Middle Eastern cultures worked from all the surviving evidence. You know, he could think, read, write in Hittite, Pittite, Shittite, Fittite, Hittite, all the other ites <laughs> that you can think of. Um, <laughs> Uh, he understood how their weights and measures worked, how their legal systems worked, and so on and so forth. With the result that his reading of, for instance, the parables, are absolutely extraordinary because he understands exactly what the references are to and how these, how these things worked at the time, what the legal issues were, uh, <coughs> and so on and so forth. So, and he was also completely aware, long before this was considered proper, he was considered vastly over erudite at the, at the time, he was aware quite how much uh, of original either Hebrew or Aramaic or the Septuagint, the Greek uh, version of the Bible, was embedded in every passage of the New Testament. Because we've tended, we've tended to be brought up to think of the New Testament as being these basically simple books that can be translated into modern uh, English, especially by you know, people who want to be cool uh, and have things like the message or whatever, some, some form of popularizing um, uh, English, and that that's cool because Jesus was all about being simple and not about being complicated. And that is a completely to lead us up the garden path. Uh, because in fact, the Gospels were far more like cliff notes for preachers of the time. It was assumed that they are, they are mnemonic devices, and now, people are beginning to recover the structures of the mnemonic devices as they were worked in the ancient world so that people could remember them, remember which parts matched which parts by a mixture of verb references and number references. There were a whole lot of ways in which people could learn these off by heart and then preach on them. But that the cliff notes worked by various words, as it were, appearing, which were up, up, um, uh, red light words, so that they could say, ah, oh, yes, I'm at this point, remember to tell them this, <laughs> because they presupposed people having recall of the texts to which they referred. And that's, in a sense, what I hope to do with you a bit today in the reading of the, of the parable. Well, it was Duncan Durrett who taught me quite how much that was at work. And since, uh, since then, I mean, he started doing that in the 1960s. Uh, since then, uh, I think uh, it's become far more widely accepted, and now there's a great deal of scholarship, for instance, into, for instance, how Luke uses the Septuagint, which is the Septuagint is the Greek version of the Hebrew Scriptures from around 200 before Christ, and is the oldest version of the Hebrew Scriptures we have. The Greek version is older than the Hebrew versions we have, because our earliest Hebrew versions come from the Qumran uh, fragments found in 47 or 48. 948, but which date from the century before Christ. So the Greek would have been the Bible for most of the people around at the time, since Hebrew was already a dead language <laughs> by the time of Christ. It was already a language known by the priestly and educated caste, rather like Latin would have been in the medieval world, but it was not the maternal language of anybody. Um, so learning one's way through all that it was he who opened that up, and I think that's now become increasingly clear. And here's one of the things. In previous generations, the people who got this right were people who had phenomenal memories. There was a, 
there was a brief period, a brief window in the mid-16th to mid-17th century with the initial bloom of Protestant exegesis when Protestants were busy translating the Bible and going back to the original languages, that they began to rediscover so many of these um, uh, resonances. And so the commentaries from that period, before rationalism descended upon everybody and encouraged flat readings, uh, they, too, they are often aware of the bits that are being referred to. But that meant people with astonishing memories, which, of course, we have less and less memory ourselves, but more and more mechanical ways of having memory. So the real answer to your question is, how am I able to do this? It's because I have a very, very good computer search program. <laughs> uh, uh, silicon is the answer to most problems. Um, and I look, literally, and I do this every Sunday, I have the gospel in, in, in English and the gospel in Greek. And if I, I read it in Greek because I was taught that as a boy at school, but uh, if there is a word there that looks complicated, and usually in every passage there's a word or two that looks complicated, I just press on it and ask the search engine to find where it appears in the Septuagint. And usually it only appears two or three times in the Septuagint, and you only have to look uh, at two or three passages and say, oh my God, it's this. And you can see it's entirely obvious because you can see that the circumstances are the same. You can see exactly why he's put this word in, in there. In other words, no great shakes. I hate to recognize the secret of my apparent erudition to you. <laughs> it's all, <laughs> it's all, uh, uh, it's all thanks to the computer. <laughs> in 25 words or less, how did you, ah. <laughs> how did you read Gerard? How do you pronounce it? How did Renish influence my theological views? Oh. In How did he influence your theological views? Even from my first, I was going to more, slightly more than 25 words, even from my first reading of him, it became clear that he was going to undo the whole of the penal substitution theory uh, of Jesus' death and begin to open out a way both of reading the scriptures and inhabiting Christianity free from that. And I think that I've been exploring that ever since. It's a single idea with astounding fecundity. Sorry, it's a bit more than 25 words, but no, not good. that many. Did anybody count? <laughs> I didn't count. How and when did you come to believe in God? Ooh. Ah. I guess I've always believed in God. I'm not sure how or what that has meant. I think that's meant different things over different times. Um, there was a particular moment of being aware and this was when I was 18 and in a low state, of being given the gift of Catholic faith. And it was, it was something very extraordinary and it put me in a, an extraordinary space for three weeks. And it was at that stage I knew I had to become a, a Catholic. And it was nothing to do with the church being this or the church being that, it was just a sense of a wholeness, a catholos uh, of something. It was just a whole thing. And once you've been given that, I mean, what else can I do? It's, it's, a, it's a gift. Uh, and I've never, ever had any reason to, uh, to doubt that. Uh, it's become uh, ever richer as I am better able to inhabit its weakness. I think that I had the wonderful privilege of learning from a mixture of Girard and Herbert McCabe. Herbert McCabe was a, uh, an English Dominican who was a very disting distinguished Thomistic, Thomistic theologian, one of the best English language Thomists, as they're called, followers of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, understanding a key insight from the Hebrew scriptures, which I've tried to talk about in the, in the book, which is the great Hebrew discovery 
of God is that God is not one of the gods. And if God is not one of the gods, then that means that God is more unlike a god than like a god. It also means that God is more like nothing at all than one of the gods. And the, why is that a huge shift? Because it's the realization that God is not in rivalry with anything that is. And the reason is that everything that is, is something that is brought into being and held in being by God. It is the object in his ken. It's not God as a kind of slightly difficult to see object in our ken. As though we are observers and some of us see this distant <laughs> galaxy called God and others don't. It's the realization that is completely the wrong way around. We are all symptoms. <laughs> this is what I call secondariness. The discovery of the creator is the discovery of being secondary in everything, which is an incredibly relaxing discovery. It's not having to do with passivity in some bad sense. It's the recognition, I am an object in someone else's ken. My desire, my intellect, all those tiny little things can be nudged into becoming more accurate to the reality that I'm being brought into being of by that which I cannot see, which is behind me, which holds me and brings me into, into being. And once, once you're on the inside of that, it's then very unproblematic to say, well, of course, so does God who brings us all into being, and that God should then have decided to share God's criteria for God, God's thought of who, God's, who God is, with us sideways by introducing God's criteria for God, which is Jesus, into our midst. Somehow seems less surprising. Why shouldn't God introduce God's criteria for God? into our midst. God's criteria for God turned out to be a human at our level. But we're pretty good at screwing up human criteria. <laughs> for instance, if we see someone executed, we might think God punished them, or they were paying a price to God. So God sends us God's interpretation of God's criteria for God <laughs> alongside us so that we can actually share in learning to read God's gift of God's criteria to us aright. And of course, God's interpretation of God's criteria for God, which is God, is what we call the Holy Spirit. So the notion that the Trinity is the same thing as Jesus and the Holy Spirit, it kind of swims naturally. Uh, if you start with that, you sort of think, yes, indeed, if you don't have that, then God is indecidable. <laughs> but God wants us to know that the secret of the whole thing is love. And to keep reminding us of that, keep to enable us to reinterpret that, to bring new meaning into life instead of the <laughs> folded down futile meaning that we're inclined to get uh, trapped in. Sorry, that's uh, only half an hour. And I, I want to be sure, though, that, I mean, some of the things we're saying, you know, what is, what could it be boiled down to, the principles, and I think you just said it, it was love. Would anybody like to ask a question to him directly? I can bring you the microphone. In your book, <clears throat> in your book, I loved <clears throat> the section on um, the uh, contrast between a uh, job interview and a conversation with your aunt. And I thought, could you go over that? Because I think that does that had a lot of meaning to me. So yeah, my aunt was called Bali, uh, but I think I called her Matilda or something. I forgot what did I call her in there. I can't remember. But anyhow, I, I invented another name. 
But yes, it's the distinction which I wanted to make between is really in the understanding of faith. Um, we, we tend to be brought up to think of faith. You must believe, because if you don't believe, you're going to hell. Faith is made part of an, uh, an emotional blackmail package. Um, this is what I call the, uh, the demand for a moonshot. You've got to fire this rocket at the moon, whether or not there is a moon. And somehow doing that is a good thing, um, whether or not there is a moon. And that seems to be exactly the reverse of what the gift of uh, faith is about. The faith is a gift. Uh, and the point of gifts is that someone gives them to you. Uh, rather than makes demands from you, unless it's a, an emotional blackmail. So, the distinction I make is between you're having a job interview and you're going to tea with your favourite aunt. If you have a job interview, you get dressed up very smartly, you polish your shoes, make sure that you're all correct, and you're got the right sort of suit and you consult people and you go up and you're determined to make a good impression. And the reason why you're determined to make a good impression is that you don't actually know what the interviewer wants <laughs> other than that they need to be impressed somehow. So you're trying to sell themselves yourself to them by what you're doing. Uh, this may or may not work depending on what the... But it's all up to you. And it's because you don't know what the interviewer wants, that you do this. If you go and have tea or whatever with Aunt Matilde, you go as yourself. She knows you. She knows your foibles. <laughs> she knows your weaknesses. She can chuck you under the chin and say, there, there. Um, uh, you don't need to put on your mask. And if you try, she'll pretty quickly, um, <laughs> she'll pretty quickly disabuse you of it. Um, stop being such a pretentious git, <laughs> she will say. <laughs> um, and why is that? It's because over time she has given you faith in her. She has produced in you the ability to relax in her having an essential goodwill towards you. That's something which she has produced in you over time, such that you relax. You're not particularly bothered about ironing out the wrinkles in your CV with her. You're able to tell her the backward story of that thing which seemed like such a success, etc., uh, etc. Et well, that's what the gift of faith is. The gift of faith is someone who has done something for you that over time allows you to relax into being who you really are in their presence. And it is the very reverse of someone saying, Make yourself look good because you don't know what the inspector is, going to, inspector is going to want from you. And yet, typically our account of faith is some version or other of the make yourself look good because you don't know how the inspector is going to, uh, what the inspector wants. So, I don't know, the, the Aunt Matilda picture is, is the right one. The gift of faith is God doing the hard, hard work. That's what Jesus was doing. I did this so that they might believe. God going through uh, the hardships of occupying the space so that we can finally actually believe that he really does love us. So I'm occupying the space so that you know that even at your very worst, I'm not out to get you. You can relax. Which is why one of the fruits of the gift of faith is becoming a less good person. Not because we're actually becoming less good, but because we're much less inclined to try to have false, fake goodness. <laughs> because we know we can be seen through, and we're not frightened of being seen through. So that's, uh, that's some of the... Does anybody else have a question? I don't know if I need the microphone. Just for the, the people online. Oh, sorry. Future generations yes. need oh. you to have the microphone. <laughs> That's frightening. I don't know if I can be myself now. Um, is the kingdom of God the party, do you think? Yeah. Both a process and a destination, an event, but also a transformation? Yes. Okay. The party is merely a shortcut. For <laughs> <laughs> OK. 
Kara. Um, let's see if I can get this out right. So I'm wondering about the step in the transformation process when, let's say, I recognize the embarrassing state of shame, but I'm interested in entering into the transformation. And I'm curious about the passage about Jesus welcoming the children and so it's a, t it's a two-parter I guess there are, t it's, there are two passages isn't it and it come one after the other. one he takes a child and then a, f a few a couple of chunks later he takes the I think that in, in the first instance we, uh, we have to remember that when that Children, in our sense, is a very modern invention. <laughs> uh, children were not taken at all seriously. Um, they were not treated as a moral excuse for absolutely everything. But the kids, but the kids! Um, <laughs> which is a kind of one of our modern moralistic things. Uh, they were kind of non-persons. Um, so in the first instance, when you remember that the disciples are f squabbling with each other as to who is first in the, who's going to be first in the kingdom. When Jesus takes a child and sits him on his lap, now health and protection would not permit that. Um, but what he's doing is taking a non-person into the place that the disciples really wanted to be. <laughs> he's making them jealous. that you want to be first in the kingdom of heaven? You become like this child. You want to be close to me? You want to be the one who sits in my lap? Well, the key way to do that is via being a non-person. One of these little ones who will later, of course, become a person. <laughs> but they're being taught there about a non-person. And I think that later on, a, uh, I can't remember the structure, but it's, it's quite clearly structured in, in Matthew's Gospel, no, in Mark's Gospel, the, the, the movement between the two kid moments. And I'd forgotten the, uh, the passage, the, the second one. After them, they're trying to stop him blessing uh, uh, them. He says, no, let them uh, come, come to be blessed. In other words, he perfectly thinks that these people are capable of being blessed. So that's the beginning, it's the beginning of our understanding of children, if you like, is non-persons being able to be blessed rather than being basically rats until they uh, reach the, the age when they can start being useful doing things about the, uh, uh, the, the house. So I'm sorry that's not a very good passage, but I don't have the text to... Um, but even the modern children that I teach get those passages because they often feel like people are trying to say, stay back, yeah. don't bother somebody, and they really love that part that Jesus brings them into the middle. Did you have one? No. Sorry, sorry to be so far in the back, uh, but uh, you've, you've discussed many theological, uh, in the abstract, theological theories and views, but I wonder how you rationalize uh, Christians going to war from the Crusades onward to the righteous World War II to later wars, some of which were righteous and some of which were not. How do you rationalize the killing and the wounding and the slaughter that goes on in war with Christian theology? After all, armies do go to, go to war with priests and, and, and pastors in every military unit. So could you discuss that just for a moment? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I don't rationalize it. Um, I'm aware that humans have gone to war ever since there have been humans, and that we are a very dangerous bunch, principally to each other. 
uh, more dangerous to each other than probably any other animal. Um, and that our understand the relationship between our understanding of God and of religion and of our bellicosity has constantly been shifting over the uh, over the ages. In early Christianity, it was understood that Christians could not in any way participate in, in war. Then after a fairly short time, there were significant enough soldiers who wanted to become Christians that that started to shift. And as you say, we're now in a thoroughly uh, ambiguous situation where you have the Patriarch of Moscow pretending that he's in favor of peace, where actually he's in favor of the invasion. And the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury trying to say, uh, no, that's not what it's all about. Um, and it's a tussle that has been going on for a very, very long time. Gott mit uns is the standard God. Uh, and it's very difficult for us to get a notion of God who is in instead only present in as far as undoing our self-destructive thing. But I think rather than this being a Christian thing, I think this is a human thing. Uh, and I think that we've got to remember that Christianity is not an ideology for Christians. It's people who are trying to be taken up into the earthquake that Christ and the Holy Spirit have produced amongst humans. Uh, and we don't do a very good job of it. But th that is where we are to be turned into witnesses. Sorry, I can't say anything more justificatory than, uh, than that. Thank you, James. I'm going to give this to Jeffrey, who had a question about Ukraine and then would like to give this to another I had a question about Ukraine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure James didn't just answer it, but I, I think, um, I think um, part of it is um, in light of what you're thinking about, what do, how do you read what's what's happening in terms of where might there be a way out mm. or through? I'm way above my pay grade, I'm afraid, uh, <laughs> as I think of, 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 of any of us. Uh, and the question is the importance of being able to give someone an off-ramp is entirely related to their ability to recognize that they're being offered an off-ramp right. rather than a different form of threat. Uh, where there is strong paranoia, anything will be interpreted as a hostile, as a hostile act. And given that this particular campaign seems to have been forged in paranoia, it's very difficult to imagine how you undo that. Uh, and the answer is I'm, I'm not at all not at all sure. Uh, so I'm sorry. Thank you. No, n nor is anyone. <laughs> so, so. I understand that there's some people working on it down at Foggy Bottom. <laughs> no question. We're ready to summarize, or not summarize exactly, but come to a, uh, an ending. James, there's so much, this has been so stimulating. It was, in fact, your introduction to me of René Girard that that uh, began to answer a question that I'd had for a long time. In fact, I asked a well-known biblical scholar, Anglican biblical scholar and theologian, what would a non-transactional understanding of the crucifixion and resurrection look like? And he said, why on earth would it? I, I thought there, was meant, there are many ways that I could go, but one of the places I've been most frequently as you've been talking is what we do in there on Sundays and in here on Sundays. And... Um, I particularly started thinking about the confession, which, which we, and I, I long since stopped thinking about the confession as the enumeration of our peccadilloes, and rather <coughs> the recognition rather as Job had at the end of his story when he repented that he was not God, and that he was sort of coming back to himself in process. And that led me <coughs> to think about uh, the absolution as an invitation to relax, which I had not thought about before uh, today. 
Um, I, I've often thought of it as a prophetic act which somehow, somehow affects that which is being proclaimed. Um, but I hadn't thought about the, the invitation now that you have recalled that you are not God, you can relax. And what happens as soon as absolution is pronounced is we rise, literally or metaphorically, for the party, and the first piece of, the, of what happens at the party is a recognition or at least a hope of the reordering of our desires. And so we pass the peace. I desire peace for you. The peace of the Lord be with you. <clears throat> I desire everything that that means when God is present. I desire justice and I desire hope and I desire uh, joy and the fruits of the Spirit and I desire that for you. The peace of the Lord be with you. And today I started thinking, recognizing that as a, <clears throat> a kind of conscious reordering of desire that we're enacting when we do that out there. And then gifts are shared, bread and wine and brought forward, the life of the community. Um, and you have deepened what I will experience tomorrow and for the rest of my life. And so for this and for all your gifts, and, and especially thanks to those of you who have stayed with us online, we are grateful to you joining us as well. James, we want to thank you and honor you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.